The Big Story. Herman, you still here? I finished it. I just finished it. Sit down, Henry. Listen. It's Armistice Day. What are you doing in the store? You aren't working. A masterpiece. Listen. Listen. Mr. Adam Haymopolis. Conduct the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. No, Herman. Not another letter. In your so-called orchestra is a so-called violin player named Tabor. If there is a worse violin player in the world, I do not know him. And it's not enough that he is a foul musician. As a human being, he is garbage. Herman, someday you'll write one too many of those letters. Someday you'll be sitting here like now, alone, after work, and the door will open and... Herman, the door, it's opening. It's a customer. No, Herman. It's not a customer. It's... Cincinnati, Ohio. The story of a man who was hated and of a reporter who proved that death and hate are often partners. The story as it actually happened. Tom Mercer's story as he lived it. Cincinnati, Ohio. You're a big man, Tom Mercer. 200 pounds big. Six feet, one inch big. And because you're big and easygoing, you're a target, an easy mark. A couple of years ago, as a young reporter, you made a mistake. You took an ordinary death and called it murder. You went and solved that murder in print. And then it came out it wasn't murder at all. And the laugh was heard all over Cincinnati. It's still heard. Wherever you go, they say of you, ah, there goes Mercer, the great flute, out to make another name for himself. And so, when this story broke, a killing in the Standard Laundry at 6216 Central Parkway... All the boys in the press room at police headquarters said... Well, we don't have to cover it. Not with Mercer on the job. If it's murder, Mercer will solve it. (laughs) (laughs) You took the laugh and went down to the scene of the crime. The standard laundry. But the laugh followed you. But when you opened the door of the laundry, Detective Lieutenant Teddy Vinson greeted you. Well, all right, man. All you cops, Sergeant, you can all go home. Tom Mercer's here. We got nothing to worry about. Hiya, Lieutenant Vincent. Man, do you want to see a real Sherlock go to work? Mercer, taking the scene. A laundry, the day Armistice Day. Not a working day. The man there on the floor, Herman with the owner, is dead. A bullet in his head. Near him, as you see, a friend, Henry Long, also shot. But not dead. Unconscious, but not dead. A gun. See the gun, Mercer? Gun on the floor between them. Also on the floor, $60 and $1 bill. On the table, a half-consumed bottle of wine. Give us your verdict, Sherlock. <laughs> oh, oh cut it out, will you, Lieutenant Vincent? Haven't you solved it yet, Mercer? You're slipping. What happened? I just told you. What the owner is dead. Long as so-called friend badly wounded. The money, the bottle of wine, that's all there's to it. Can't you figure it out? No, I can't. What's your idea? Well, the great Mercer is stumped. What do you know? I said, I'll let you in on a secret. That man, Whit, was killed. <laughs> how? <laughs> how, he says, how? Why, your gun. That's how. <laughs> oh, please, Mason, will you? Okay. Why, well, is no joke, is it? Well, there it is, open and shut. Two of them were friends. Like all friends, they got into a fight. Had a little too much to drink, got around the money, and that's all. Which shot long, long shot fit. Do we do? As we say on the force, solved. Mm. Can I, uh, look around? Look around? Well, of course, Mr. Mercer. Look around by all means. No doubt we overlooked some special clue which proves the murderer was a left-handed Irish. I who... think you're wrong, Lieutenant. Huh? How? Where's the other gun? 
What other gun? He said long shot wit and wit shot long. What did they do? Use one gun between them? Where's the other gun? Maybe, maybe he tossed it somewhere. Oh, no. You said they were drunk. Got to fighting. Look at that bottle. So? That's sweet wine. More than two-thirds of the bottle still left. They didn't have enough to even warm them up. They weren't drunk. You don't know what you're talking about. Have you taken the bullet out of Long yet? You see, he's still unconscious. Of course not. When you do, I'm pretty sure you'll find it didn't come from Witt's gun. Witt didn't shoot Long. And I don't think Long shot Witt. Want to bet? I don't bet, Lieutenant. Not on murder. Okay, okay. Hey, Sergeant, get ballistic. Get ballistics here fast and hurry up that ambulance for Long. Mercer, the great sleuth. Okay, Mercer. Just watch. The lieutenant is a good guy. You know that. Just a guy who, with everybody else, likes to kid you, Tom Mercer. But you can take it. And you don't gloat. You don't gloat when later, ballistics gets through examining the bullets removed from Witt's body and from the chest of Henry Long, still unconscious at the general hospital. You don't gloat when the lieutenant says, Both bullets, the one in Witt and the one in Long, were fired from a forty-five. And the gun on the floor of the laundry was a thirty-eight. That's right. Hmm. Then maybe it was a left-handed Irishman, Lieutenant. All right, Mercer. Some other time. I got work to do. So have you, Tom Mercer. You have work to do, too. A murder's been committed, and if Long dies, maybe a double murder. If you want to end the laughter, just being right on the bullets doesn't do that. You want to solve this murder. So you wait. You wait at General Hospital. But the only man who can possibly tell what happened in the laundry that armistice day, Henry Long, is still unconscious. You wait in the cart outside his room for ten hours, for the moment when he'll regain consciousness, if he ever does. And when the nurse says... He's conscious now, Mr. Mercer. He's talking. You quietly enter the room. Mr. Long, can you tell me what happened? I told him to write a poison pen letter. All the time he wrote them, he hated him, Tabor. Tabor? Who's Tabor? But he wrote it. He wrote it. I said someday the door will open and someone will walk in and it opened the door. Opened. When was this? Maybe the man was a customer. He said, where's my laundry? Herman said, I'm close today. He said, where's my laundry? Angry. Did you see him? Then it happened. Herman came back. He opened the desk for money. Fell out. He took out his gun. He tried to fire a shot, but the man fired first. Herman's gun went off and he fell, and I screamed. The man shot me. I couldn't move. I dragged myself to the phone. I called the police. Everybody hated him. Everybody. Mr. Long, can't you hear me? Did you see him? When the man said, Where's my laundry? Herman said, What's the name and address? I couldn't hear the answer. Only. Herman said, I'll write it down. Did he write it down? He was tall, thin, with black hair, a carnation in his lapel. I saw it, and he hated Herman. He hated him in his eyes. You could see it. I told him, don't write poison pen letters. Enough people hate you already. Don't. But he did. And now he's dead. It's long. Mr. Long. It's no use, Mr. Mercer. He's unconscious again. That's right. I was Mr. Witt's secretary. Tain's my name, Gloria Tain. He wasn't very well liked, was he, Mr. Witt? Are you kidding? How many friends does a skunk have? What do you mean? I'm not saying anybody'd kill him, but take Mr. Long, who was a friend of his. He cheated Long out of $2,000 a year ago. Anybody in the shop will tell you. He worked out like slaves. He never had a good word for anybody. Ever hear of a man named Tabor? Uh, no. Sure? I don't lie. He lied. He lied all the time. He lied to everybody and about everybody. I'm not sorry he's dead. And there are a lot more who feel the same way? Oh, well, everybody who knew him. Hate is a clue. Who hated him enough to kill him? You begin digging. Two weeks ago, you find 
He fired a man who'd been with him 12 years. A man named Emmons, a bookkeeper. Sure, I hated him. 12 years I gave him. Worked late, sweated for him. What did he give me? My walking papers. But, Mr. Emmons, you didn't hate him enough... To shoot him? I wouldn't waste a bullet on him. You know something, mister? 15 years ago, he played the fiddle. Played with some orchestra. I, the Cincinnati Symphony, I think. And he got fired. He never forgot it. He kept writing letters. Poison pen letters every week. Saying this fiddle was no good. That one was no good. That's the kind of a man he was. Take what he did to Tabor. Tabor? That's right. First violin in the symphony. He always said Tabor stole his job. He used to call them up in the middle of the night, two o'clock, and scare Tabor's wife. She had to go away to a sanitarium. He was nuts, mister. That's what he was. Wish he died years ago. Wish I never met him. What happened to Tabor's wife? His wife? I, I don't know. I, I think she died in the sanitarium. Tabor is still with the symphony? Sure. Why? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Just an idea. <laughs> I am Tabor, Mr. Mercer, and I'll be frank with you. No news of the past ten years pleased me as much as the death of Herman West. Uh, but uh, as to what you're thinking, since I'm tall and thin and have dark hair and occasionally wear a carnation, at the time of the murder, 4.45 p.m. on Armistice Day, you see, I read all the details. I enjoyed the story. I was playing a concert in Indianapolis. I was playing the solo part at that precise moment of the Beethoven Violin Concerto. <laughs> Hate comes to a dead end. What now? Back at the laundry, still probing, still asking questions of Witt's secretary. Suddenly, she says... This is funny. What? This slip, this laundry slip. I make out all the laundry slips, but this ain't in my handwriting. Let me see it. Hmm, 2231 Vine Street. You have a customer there? No, I checked it. That's what's funny. Is this his writing? Oh, Mr. Witt's. Hey, that's right, it is. Where'd you find it? In his desk drawer, crumpled up. Give like... it to me. Give it to me quick. Yes? Can I help you? Ma'am, I'm looking for a man. Tall, thin, dark haired, sometimes wears a carnation in his buttonhole. A hole. man? Oh, dear, no. This is a boarding house for business women. Uh, no gentlemen allowed here. None whatsoever. Oh. You're sure? I'm quite sure, young man, quite. Only the most respectable women. And I require two references. And you can believe me that I know my dentist. I never pry, but I know my lady. Murder and 2231 Vine Street don't mix. You walk down the steps, dejection written on your face. And on the sidewalk you meet, you would with your luck, Detective Lieutenant Vincent. Well, Hawkshaw, I hear you got it all wrapped up. Yeah, The yeah. secretary told me. 2231, fine. No doubt when Witt asked him, the murderer gave his right address. Okay, Lieutenant, I was wrong. Wrong? You? Impossible. Listen, I'll give you a tip. That carnation in the buttonhole, remember? Well, I checked, and guess what? There's only several hundred bars in town selling carnations. Why don't you check the Mercer? Why not? Go ahead. For years now, you've been the butt of bad jokes, Tom Mercer. They call you Hawkshaw and Sherlock, Mercer the sleuth. And in the present case, it looks like you're going to make a fool of yourself again. For you, Tom Mercer... Reporter for the Cincinnati Inquirer has tracked down every lead in the slaying of Herman Witt, laundry owner. And every lead has led to the same place. Nowhere. First, you went after people who hated Witt. An employee, the first violinist in the symphony orchestra. Each time, you drew nothing. Then the address on the laundry slip. Nothing. Less than nothing. An absurd spinster running a boarding house for business ladies. Might as well, as Lieutenant Vincent of Homicide put it, track down all the stores that sell carnation. Why not? Crazy as it sounds, it might be something. 
Say that again? I said, can you recall selling carnations regularly, mind you, to a man, tall, thin, with dark hair, well-dressed, I imagine? A fellow who bought carnations all the time would be well-dressed. And that's what I thought you said. What are you, a detective? Well, not exactly. On that wood killing, huh? Yeah, that's right. Well, I've heard of some pretty stupid things in my time, but if that's the way you fellas work, it's no wonder there's so many unsolved crimes in this city. Now, why do you say that? Why? I sell maybe a hundred carnations a day to a hundred different people. Me and a couple of hundred other florists. Do you honestly expect me to give you a clue? (laughs) Why, the man asks. He's right. Of course he's right. You were grasping at a straw and hoping you'd come up with the answer. The carnation idea is crazy. You give it up. And then, on your desk at the paper, a day later... Is a message. Call Miss Eulalie Rinka, City 7113. The address is 2231 Vine. 2231 Vine. Eulalie Rinka, the lady who runs the boarding house for businesswomen. You don't call, you race over. Now, mind you, I don't pry into the affairs of my tenants. I understand, Miss Rinka. And I'm very strict in my requirements. Two references are essential. Yes, so you told me. Well, after you were here, uh, mind you, I don't pry, but I did do a little uh, inquiring, and well, after all, it was a murder now, wasn't it? That's right, a murder. Well, and... the lady on the third floor, Rhea, Miss Sands, a very sweet old lady. Yes. She's really secretly married and estranged from her husband. Can you imagine? Is that all you found? Quite the contrary. That was only the beginning. And Miss Curtis on second floor front. She drinks. I found, can you believe it, six empty whiskey bottles in her bureau drawer, the bottom drawer. Look, Miss Rinker, oh, I... Oh, I haven't told you all. Then there's Miss Bascom, a first floor rear. A very quiet, a sweet person, really. I've got to get back She's to She's a confidential place. secretary. But I'd never hire her. Do you know what, Miss Messer? She keeps live mice. Not at all. But she has a forty-five automatic in her desk drawer. What? I had my handyman in, and he told me it was a forty-five uh, caliber. Is that the word, caliber? Yes. A forty-five caliber automatic revolver in her desk drawer. Miss Bascom? That's correct. Would you mind coming down with me to police headquarters? Indeed, I would mind a great deal. All I want to do is have them examine your gun, Miss Bascom. I have no gun. Not now you haven't. I have it. That is, Miss Rinker and I have it. I have a permit for the gun. Did you know the gun was fired? I guess within the past week. Did you know that, that it was fired twice? No, it wasn't. How could it have been? You tell me, Miss Bascom. Look, I don't want to go to the police. Please, I don't. If I tell you, will that be enough? It depends on what you tell me. Well, I, I lent it to a man, a casual acquaintance. He said he wanted to buy a gun. I wanted to sell it. So I lent it to him to try it out. He took it, and later he brought it back and said, this won't do. When was this? About a week ago. Armistice Day? I think it was. Yeah, I missed this day. Yeah, I wasn't working that day. What time did you lend it to him? About uh, 2 o'clock. When did he bring it back? About 5.30, I think. Yeah, uh, he, he just said he wanted to try it out. Why, what happened? He tried it out, Miss Bascom. About 4.45, he tried it out on two men. What? He killed one of them. No. Yes. Now, uh, what was his name, this casual friend of yours? John Turner. I'm sorry about your not wanting to go to the police, Miss Bascom, because I'm afraid my friend, Lieutenant Vincent, would never forgive me if I didn't take you down with me. Shall we go? That's his picture, Miss Bascom? Yes, sir, Lieutenant. There's no question. This is the man. If you don't mind, Mercer, let me do the asking. Sorry. Uh, there's no question this is the man? No, sir, no question. He was just a friend of yours, Miss Turner? Oh, not, not a friend. I just met him once, once or twice. Okay, okay, you can go, but be on tap if I need you. Yes, sir. And I hope you have a permit for that gun. Oh, yes, sir, I do, if you want to see it. All right, all right, never mind. Use that door. Yes, sir. Well, quite a record our friend Turner has. Larceny, breaking and entering, narcotics charge, wanted in Kansas, auto theft. Can't figure it. Can't figure it. Why? The whole thing's crazy. A guy writes poison pen letters. His employees hate him. Everybody hates him. Then this turns up. Nuts. Mm. Can I say something? Hmm? I said, can I say something? What? The long arm of coincidence is a funny thing. Don't give me police theories, Hawk. Hawkshaw, I've heard it before. Now, don't worry, I'm not sensitive. Will you let me talk for just a minute? Go ahead. What stopped us, all of us, you, me, everybody, was that Wit was a hated man. When a hated man gets killed, hate, we figure, must be the motive. So we suspected Tabor or Emmons. I even thought for a while it was long. So? But it wasn't any of these people. It 
was an accident, a pure and simple accident. The motive was robbery, pure and simple robbery. Turner's a pro. His record shows it, a professional gunman. He figures he'll knock over this laundry. He takes Armistice Day because no one will be around and the banks are closed, so there'll be cash there. He goes in. He puts on a front by asking for his laundry. When Whit gets suspicious and pulls out a gun, he kills him. He shoots long and escapes. Since when does a pro give his right address? It wasn't his right address. It was the first address that came to his mind. He hadn't planned it all the way. When he asked Whit for his laundry, Whit asked for his address. That surprised him, so he said, just like that, 2231 Vine. Even pros make mistakes. You know something? What? I think you're right. No. Yep. Oh, sure, I think this time you're right. Well, thanks, uh, Lieutenant. Never mind the thanks. Now we've got to find Turner. And that won't be easy. Well, Lieutenant, I thought I'd leave something for the police to do. The laughter connected with your name, Tom Mercer, goes out of people's voices. When you write your story on who the killer is, how it was found out, the cracks begin to fade away. The wise guy looks. And then the dragnet goes out. John Turner. Tall, thin, dark-haired, carnation in the buttonhole. Wanted in Kansas. Wanted for breaking and entering. Wanted for murder. You keep the story alive during the months of the search for him. You keep the people aware that he's around, what he looks like. So that one evening, the laughter around your name goes away for all time. Because this happened in a fruit store on the outskirts of town. Close enough, mister. That's all right. But if you want a dose of orange, maybe some apples, I'll get them for you. No. Instead of the oranges, mister, or the apples, mister, give me what's in the cash register. What? You don't know get my money? <coughs> Stay there. I call the police. Hey. Uh, you somebody I know. You the man... That's right. You the man I read about in the paper. You the man killed the man who owned the laundry. That's right. Operator, you give me the police. That's right. Now we read you that telegram from Tom Mercer of the Cincinnati Inquirer. Killer in tonight's big story was arrested and brought to trial for the murder of the laundry owner. During the trial, I visited him in jail and asked why he had been foolish enough to give a traceable address at the time of the holdup. He replied, I was a little rattled then, but the chief trouble all my life has been that I can't help telling the truth. Inherently, I am an honest man. He was convicted and subsequently died in the electric chair. In order to protect the names of persons actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter. The Big Story was previously released by NBC, the national broadcasting company for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our servicemen and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs> 